Uh, hey everyone, welcome to the 173rd monthly, and I'm going to speak up a little bit because apparently it's hard to hear in the back, so excuse me. But uh, welcome to the 173rd monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Um, tonight we're going to be hearing from Sam Kotler on provisioning and managing bare metal, VMs, and cloud instances with Foreman. Tonight, before we get started, we have four quick requests. Um, first, silence your cell phones. Just put them on vibrate. Uh, second, do not use the coffee maker, any of the coffee makers. Uh, three, do not eat any snacks and noisy wrappers during the presentations. They, the sound carries even from the back. Like, go in the back room or, or outside, please, if you must. Um, and please use the mic for questions at the end so you can be heard here in the recording. Uh, it's very disruptive when the uh, presenter has to repeat the question or people are saying, what, what, through the whole place. You've been there. Um, we'd also like to quickly thank Google for graciously allowing us to use this great space. I'd like to thank our other sponsors, uh, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. In addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly over the years. After the meeting, we encourage folks to join us for more talks and drinks at McKenna's Pub at 250 West 14th Street. We'll have a couple of groups heading over, so don't worry about taking down the address. And we do have reservations in the back, so they'll turn down the volume. And people will have a, a, a general volume that's conducive to conversation. Uh, a few quick announcements. That is, uh, first, our next monthly meeting, we'll, we will be hearing from Patrick McGarry about Ceph, a distributed object store, block store, and file system. Our next workshop will be on August 27th, I believe. Uh, that's correct. Great. Uh, please find Rob Menes, David Bristow, or James Meldrum if you have any questions about our workshops, or Hannah, who's over here as well. Or Rob. Uh, or Rob, I didn't say Rob at first? Uh, we should mention that the 13th, we're not having the meetings. Okay, good point. There, uh, the next meeting is again on the 27th. There will be no meeting on the 13th. Um, don't forget to grab a distro DVD from the back table if you want to try out a, a Linux distro and you don't have one at the moment. And um, the only announcement I'm going to make other than that is that DevOps Days 2013 will be October 17th to 18th this year. Uh, registration has opened up. You can register at devopsdays.org uh, and click on the New York uh, event. That's going to be following, I believe, Velocity NYC, which, uh, or I believe it's Velocity, right? Yeah. Um, does anyone have any additional announcements they'd like to make before we get going? Okay, uh, then please hold your questions until Sam uh, says he's ready for them. Oh, and after Sam's questions, we have the normal uh, giveaway at the end of the presentation of, uh, where Sam asks questions, he gives away a book for the cor first correct answer. There will also be, is, is this right, an additional giveaway, Julian? Yeah. There'll be one more giveaway where you can uh, put your card into a hat and or find a hat or something anyway. And, oh, great. So we got Julian's got that all sorted out, but we'll conduct that after uh, uh, Sam's presentation. Anyway, um, Please welcome Sam, talking about Foreman. Alrighty, uh, I'm Sam Kotler. I work at Red Hat, where I work on a project called the Foreman. It's um, free and open source. It's GPL 83, um, kind of piece of management software that sits atop of it, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, this talk will be at this URL after. I'll post it in the meetup so you don't need to write it down. So the reason Foreman exists is, is fairly straightforward, which is um, these kind of three unique silos that uh, we use to think about the way Foreman manages servers. Um, so the first is provisioning, and this includes things like uh, getting the box online, so configuring DHCP, DNS, all the things you need to bring up a server and have it talk to the network. Configuration, which is taking a machine and getting it into a state where you can actually do useful work with it which is what we use Puppet for, and then reporting, which is kind of the next layer, which is finding out how machines change over time and helping them achieve state changes over time. So first, um, on the provisioning side, the goal is to take nothing and turn it into something. So that nothing may be um, a virtualization host or a public cloud or a private cloud or just a physical machine that doesn't have an OS on it. Um, and one of the principal tenets is that we never want to have uh, provisioning processes that are drastically different between public cloud, private virtualization setups, and physical hardware. So um, we want to be able to create new machines from scratch and create them the same all the time. Um, and recreate new machines with using Puppet or just raw configuration from nothing. So you want to be able to reprovision a machine at any time. And then 
do things like um, add a DHCP lease or DNS entries. And we have a tool called the Smart Proxy that we use um, that's a Sinatra app, which I'll talk about a little later, that exposes things that don't have APIs to the public internet using um, REST interfaces. So things like getting the next available DHCP lease, adding DNS entries to find. Um, and also, we manage TFTP. So if you're using TFTP in a, in a DHCP environment to be able to um, send down a, a RAM disk and initial kernel, we support managing TFTP servers in an automated fashion. So when you go to install a machine, instead of having to load an ISO or whatever, um, we actually will manage the remote TFTP installation for you. Um, Kickstart and pre-seed templating. So if you've ever worked in a kind of traditional physical hardware environment, you use Kickstart on RHEL-based distros or pre-seed on uh, Debian-based distros to be able to do installation on hosts. Um, and that's so that you don't have to actually click through the installer manually. And we offer a pretty robust templating system to be able to manage machines over time um, through uh, history systems and, and other things that should. And then finish scripts, which um, if you want finish scripts to be the end of Foreman's kind of um, involvement in an installation, you can just use finish scripts to get the machine into a state where you can actually run workloads. So a finish script is basically a shell script, usually bash, but if you're a CSH person, that's cool too. Um, and you just basically uh, write the script that's in a template form, so it's an e in an ERB form, and then take it and it gets run on the host and, and uh, you get kind of very, very complex management abilities with it, but it's not Puppet. So a lot of people use it to be able to just install Puppet on the machine. So if you're using Puppet, which is the next step, um, you use a finish script just to be able to get a machine into enough of a state that you can run Puppet on it. And then Puppet does the actual configuration. So as I said, Foreman sits atop Puppet, and I'll show kind of exactly where we do this, but um, we use Puppet to take a machine that you've provisioned and now is connected to a network, it doesn't have to be the public internet obviously, but it's connected to a network, um, and install whatever things you need on it. So if you're building Apache servers or HA proxy servers or Postgres machines, whatever, we use Puppet to get the machine from an installed state to a configured state, which is basically, um, you know, you've now installed a bunch of packages, you're managing templates. How many people are familiar with Puppet or Chef? Whoa. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> that's way more than I expected. Um, so on the configuration side, we also provide a robust uh, way to be able to assign classes to hosts and group of, groups of hosts. And these are hierarchical. So if any of you Puppet users are familiar with, actually Chef has this built in, but um, if any of you Puppet users are familiar with Hyro, which is a, basically a hierarchical way to pass data into Puppet modules, um, we support a hyra like thing where you can use all the data structures that we provide to be able to, and I'll make this more concrete because I realize it's very kind of broad, but you can use all the data structures that we provide to, to give node nodes attributes and then configure them based on them. And we also have host groups. So host groups are intended to um, group hosts together in a way that are kind of like roles. So all your Postgres masters go in one, uh, host group, all your Apache servers go in another. So you can also split these out across locations of organizations, um, which are intended to be able to provide kind of multi-data center support uh, with locations. And people are even using them, so if you want to manage a rack that's just a location, and you can uh, you can ultimately nest them. And also organizations, so if you have a junior sysadmin kind of person who manages the finance unit's uh, hosts, that you just put those hosts into the finance business unit, and then that admin can only see those. And then the last thing is reporting. So this is after you've got a machine online, it's provisioned and it's doing its thing, you want to see how it's changing over time and if it falls out of the desired state and then correct it. So we use Puppet's reporting functionality, um, which is basically just an output of what happened during the run to uh, be able to provide reports. And then we also have um, trends, drift detection, and statistics, which are all kind of tied together. So this is what Foreman looks like. Um, as I said, it's a Ruby application, and this is the single host page. So you have the host name, um, some data about what's going on, and then kind of the runtime of the host. This is just one of my machines that I manage with Foreman. So this is what the reporting interface looks like, and 
when things fail or, um, or restarts happen or changes get applied, you see that in here. So you can also see I'm running Puppet every hour. Um, and so as we kind of see change over time, as you roll out changes to your Puppet Master, you can see kind of what's going on. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with, with Puppet, you basically just deploy to the Puppet Master and then those modules get pulled in by nodes that you can get. So these are statistics. Um, so you can see I mostly have CentOS here, but I also have a Fedora machine and a Debian machine. Uh, there's also <laughs> Raspberry Pi now, which I'll show, which is kind of fun. Um, and all x86, 64 bit x86. Um, and you'll see here we have the, the environments. So uh, Puppet has this concept of environments, and they're meant to kind of separate out what does what in each environment. So if you have development machines, you manage development in the development environment, and then you can test changes in a less risky place than production. Um, and trends, so trends are basically anything that you can get off of a machine using a fact, which is just a piece of inventory. Um, this is part of Puppet, so Puppet has these, uh, the idea of a fact, which is something about the machine. So in this case, this is running on an OpenStack instance, and because of that, I get metadata that's exposed to the OpenStack instance. And so here I can track over time the AMI that I'm using. There's also a whole bunch of other ones that you can track. So you can also write these yourself. So say you have uh, your own inventory tagging system. You can use that to get data, um, or you can use Factor to get data out of the system and expose it here and watch it change over time. So now that we kind of understand what Foreman's trying to do, I'm gonna show you how Foreman works. So the core tenant of, of um, Foreman's management system for, for remote piece of infrastructure are these things called the smart proxies, which are these very small modular um, Ruby applications. And you basically run one of these wherever, wherever you need to manage something. So the idea is, instead of having to manually go to your DHCP server, look at the available leases, we'll go talk to your DHCP server when you decide that you want a new host, and come back with the next available um, address in the series of, of available DHCP leases. Um, same thing with bind, so we can add records to bind, um, or more generically, just to DNS servers, um, and manage TFTP servers. So if you, um, as I said earlier, managing TFTP is really annoying because you have to download all these files and get them in the right order. Um, instead, we'll set up the remote machine for you. So you say, uh, this is my TFTP server. This has the T TFTP feature enabled on it. It's just a YAML file that you configure. And from there, you're able to manage kind of all the different kernels and RAM disks that exist on that system. Sorry if that's, if you don't manage TFTP, it's totally full right now. Um, another thing is, uh, is BMC and IPMI. So if you're using um, like baseboard management systems like iDRAC or um, HP, basically every manufacturer has one. We can talk to those to power on physical hosts uh, and reboot them remotely. So if a, if a box hard locks up, we can actually expose an interface to you to reboot, to reboot the machine. Um, the, the smart proxy also runs on your puppet masters. So if you have a bunch of puppet masters and they all have a lot of modules across different environments, we import the, the modules off of the, the different puppet masters and expose them to you to assign to hosts and host groups. Um, and also you can sign puppet certificates. So puppet uses PKI to authenticate uh, agents, which are remote machines. And so we use uh, the same functionality that you would run on the command line, but we just run it through um, a REST interface that we expose on the public master. And a new thing um, that got added a few months ago was uh, mCollective support. So if any of you are using mCollective, you can use the, the Puppet Agent plugin to be able to manage lots and lots of remote machines. Um, and it's a much more scalable model than what we had before, which was Puppet Kit, which is a fairly, uh, it's a simple model, but it's very, it doesn't scale very well on, on lots of puppet masters. And the proxy is really easy to add stuff to, so all the time people come into our IRC channel and kind of ask, hey, I want to manage all these different thing, random things. I have my own DNS implementation because I'm crazy, and, and it's real, people do that. Um, and, uh, and they want to manage their own things. So it's, it's really straightforward Ruby code, and um, 
we're also working to make it very, very modular. So ultimately, you won't even have all the extra stuff installed on a proxy. So right now, the proxy code is one code base, but it's, it's a thousand, about a thousand lines of Ruby. Ultimately, you'll just have, I want to install these little features, and then you install them through Ruby. So the way Foreman, uh, a kind of production Foreman deployment looks is a bunch of proxies, and these all may live in a different location. So the DHCP proxy may just be managing DHCP in your remote data center, and then the Puppet, DHCP, and DNS proxy all serve their piece of functionality in another data center, uh, and then TFTP, DHCP, and a CA proxy in a third. Or they may be in a single data center, you just have all these different things that you need to manage. And then Foreman has this concept of compute resources, and compute resources are uh, intended to allow you to provision lots of VMs, um, primarily VMs, also bare metal, on public and private clouds. So if you have VMware infrastructure, we support that. Um, there are a whole bunch of them, and we're constantly adding more. GCE will, will get merged soon. So the idea is then once you provision a machine on a, on a compute resource, that machine then starts talking to, the, to a puppet master on a given proxy, and we start getting reports about that machine into Foreman, and we can also classify what kind of machine it is. So the puppet integration focuses on reporting, node classification, and kind of puppet module and CA management. So the reporting side of things is you, we get reports out of Foreman. So uh, sorry, out of Puppet, rather. And so when you see the Puppet agent run on a machine, you can then go and look at what happened during that given run. Um, another aspect is um, Puppet has this, this notion of node classification, which is a script that you run on a, on a Puppet Master, and it spits back some YAML. The details are kind of straightforward, but it basically spits back some YAML about what kind of machine this should be, and then Puppet makes it so on the remote machine. I'll show this as well. Um, and then Puppet Master and CA Management I already talked about. We, we run proxies um, wherever you need to manage a CA or, or Puppet modules and import them off of a host. We, you just run a smart proxy there. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Puppet, which I think is very few, so I'll make this light. Um, typically, you have a lot of modules and they're very, very compartmentalized. So you say, when I want to install Libvirt on this host, I add the libvirt module. When I want to install MongoDB on this host, I add the MongoDB module. So the compute resource side of things is really focused on being able to take a new machine and provision it the same way through finished scripts, which I talked about. So on public clouds where you just you provision a new machine and then you get SSH access to it, we go and run the, 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 the finished script on that host. So that host says, um, you know, once it comes online, we SSH into it using a key that we uniquely generate for each host that we're uh, managing. Um, same with OpenStack um, and Rackspace and, and VMware is a little bit more complicated, but still the same idea. And on Libvirt, you have kind of two options, one of which is to use uh, just a standard TFTP and, and Pixie-based installation if you're using DHCP, uh, or you can uh, provision off of the So when you're creating a new host, and I'm going to actually create a new host on EC2 in a minute, but when you're creating a new host, you get to see all of the different classes that got imported off of uh, a given Puppet Master. And so that Puppet Master can be anything from, um, you know, something that lives in, that's global for all your data centers or specific to individual data centers. And then when you tell this host where it's going to get provisioned, um, again, you'll see that, you can then see all the available classes for that uh, that smart proxy. So this, this basically allows you to build individual hosts that are kind of unique in the way they, they operate without having to manage lots of individual hosts like you traditionally would. And with the idea of host groups, you can create hosts that are all the same. So all of my API servers, for example, they're all the same, they're stateless, it doesn't matter. You just run Puppet on them and you get um, all the benefits from the host group. So you get all the parameters that are configured on that host group and then you can take that configuration and apply it to as many machines as you want. And the provisioning, once you choose the options, um, is completely automated. So there's no kind of chance of human error, which traditionally, if you go and provision an EC2 instance, install something on it, everyone does it a little bit differently, 
they kind of press the way they like to do things onto the machines they provision. So Foreman kind of takes the stance that Ming should be opinionated, and but you get to decide the opinion, but you have to do it kind of more. So as I said, this is what external node classification looks like. So the puppet master executes this script on um, on agent check-in. So the agent calls home and says, give me back my configuration, my catalog in, in the puppet world. And uh, the puppet master executes the script, and the only argument is its host name, or its cert name, which is generally its host name. And that basically allows you to get the output of what this machine is supposed to be. So it's supposed to have these classes, so it's supposed to have log wash and MOTD and uh, NTP and configure the puppet agent in this way. Um, and so that makes it really straightforward to be able to um, provision lots of hosts at once and then I'll have them all check into one puppet master. And as I said, compute resources are just hosts that you're managing. So we have two unique concepts of how hosts live in the world. Um, one of them is we're managing them and the other is unmanaged. So managed is we provisioned it and now we manage it and we can destroy it. And unmanaged is this is a puppet agent that's talking to this puppet master and we're telling it about its configuration, but we don't have control over its compute resource. And there's a patch waiting to have to be reviewed in, in the pull request queue right now that will let you convert from an unmanaged host to a managed host um, on a compute resource. So that'll be a really powerful thing to be able to say, um, you know, I, I have all these old machines and it was before we had Foreman, but now we want to take all those hosts and they should live in Foreman and I want to be able to delete them and kind of alter how much RAM a box has, stuff like that. Um, and so you can convert a host that you previously didn't manage into something that now you do control. And these are configured via provisioning templates, which I talked about finish scripts and finish scripts are kind of a subset of provisioning templates. Um, and I realize, again, this is all very, very abstract, so I'll make it real in a minute. Um, but we also, uh, another example of a provisioning template is um, a kickstart that is templated out. So you can use ERB, which is a Ruby templating language, to be able to um, kind of build these configs dynamically. So stuff like uh, setting up the owner's uh, key in the root user account, you can do that directly through the, the interface and then dynamically provision dynamically put that into a provision template. I'll show you a rendered one in a, in a pre rendered one and you'll see. But basically when it's time to provision a host, we generate this template specific to that host and then SSH to the machine and run the template. Um, also if anyone's using Cloud in it, we just merged a pull request that adds support for uh, running finished scripts via Cloud in it. So if you're using that um, the metadata service that's in EC2 and a lot of other um, cloud providers, private open stack installations, things like that, makes a lot of sense to be able to just use one tool to initialize the system and then kind of get it into a working state to run Puppet on it. And if you haven't checked out Cloud on it yet, it's a pretty cool tool. Um, I think lots of people are excited about it. So when I want to go and create a new host, I choose where it's going to live. Um, if you just are taking agents, remote nodes that you want to start talking to your puppet master or are already talking to your puppet master, all you have to do to get Foreman to work is connect up two scripts between the puppet master and Foreman um, and the host will just start checking in and then you'll be able to manage them. Um, but if you want to create new hosts, which means provision a host uh, either on bare metal or a compute resource, you use this page. So you give the host a name, you choose where it's going to get deployed. So if it's, if it's physical hardware, you we match based on the MAC address. So you take, you know, you, you give us a MAC address and then when that MAC address calls to Foreman, we'll be able to say, hey, we recognize you, you have a name, we know you're supposed to have these public classes and then assign those classes to that host and, you know, it already has a name and all that stuff. But if you're using um, remote compute resources, we uh, use the FOG library to be able to go and communicate with compute resources and then provision new hosts on them. So I'm going to show a demo where I provision on EC2 um, and then run Puppet on that host. And all I would have to do if I wanted to provision on EC2 versus Rackspace is change this dropdown to be Rackspace. So um, as I said before, one of the, the major goals is to be able to provision the same host on a lot of different compute resources over and over again. So I talked about provisioning templates. And provisioning templates are the way that we kind of are able to take hosts that we don't yet know about or want to create and turn them into something that's meaningful um, and then go and run Puppet on it. 
So finished scripts are the most simple one, which you essentially always use. Um, snippets are basically sub-provisioning templates, so they're exactly what they are. They're a snippet, so you include them in, in a provisioning template that you're building. So on Debian and RHEL, your provisioning templates are going to be different, but you want to be able to share stuff like Etsy hosts, because that's not going to be different. And so you install, you know, you can manage all that stuff through a, a snippet. Um, and the other cool thing about snippets is you still get the same templating inside of them, so you can template out. They basically get rendered in line as you, um, when the host gets built or when that provisioning template gets called. Um, Are you using Cobbler for that, or is it something specific for me? Uh, so I'll give more background on that later, actually. Um, so we can also manage uh, IPixy configuration and GPixy configuration, and then, as I said, um, Precede and Kickstart. And if you're not familiar with IPixie and GPixie, IPixie is kind of the more modern tool, but it's essentially a, a network installation uh, system that GPixie is much older, but IPixie is kind of becoming the modern standard for provisioning stuff. Uh, especially on a lot of different uh, virtual, like Libvirt implements IPixie. And it's, it's cool if you uh, are in a limited environment as well. So if you have a, an environment where you can't use TFTP, uh, IPixie can use HTTP to be able, or just regular TCP to be able to, um, to be able to grab the the RAM disk and uh, kernel. So this is what a finished script looks like. Um, this is one that I use to provision RHEL-like machines. So if it's a Fedora box, I'll show you this exact one. But if it's a Fedora machine, um, you know I install stuff in there. So you can basically, you see here, for example. Um, that I'm filling, I have a host object and I'm getting parameters out of it and then putting that into a file. So here, I, this is an example of where you could say, this administrator's key should get installed onto the machine right away so that then they can go and manage the box. Can you enlarge that? It's very difficult. Uh, it's in a PDF, so I, I'll, I'm going to show it. Same thing as the Kickstarter. So then, once you have these individual templates configured, you assign them to a type of host. So, um, for example, I associated this with all x86 um, CentOS or RHEL machines that um, that I'm managing should use the RHEL finish script. Uh, and when you're going and provisioning a new host, you just click resolve, and then it figures out which uh, finish script it should be using. And if you're managing stuff like Kickstart, so if this is um, a compute resource or physical host that supports Kickstart or Precede, you'll also see those in there. We also manage uh, partition tables, and this is a little bit less relevant on cloud stuff, but if you're provisioning physical machines, um, you want to be able to kind of manually configure your partition tables. And so then you associate these with operating system families as well, and on provision time, we'll then go and manage um, this part of the script. You can see it's less clear, because there's no syntax highlighting here, but um, same thing, this is a parameter on a host. And then compute res uh, uh, images on compute resources. So if you're using Rackspace or AWS or um, uh, VMware private clouds, uh, you can go and provision images and AMIs to be able to then go provision hosts on top of them. So you can choose, uh, all my administrators should be able to use this one CentOS AMI, or all my administrators are using Ubuntu 13.04, it should be the same AMI all the time. So this is another really annoying problem where an administrator chooses one AMI over another and then you have diverging OSs and just weird things going on. So here's another example of where the, the kind of system lets you be opinionated in your own way. So it's demo time. So just to start off, I'm going to show uh, provisioning a completely new machine. So this is a box that I provisioned earlier. It's on uh, AWS. So just to show you kind of what that looks like, you can see it's been up for zero days. Um, but more importantly, you can see all the facts on the machine. So if you want to go and search for all the machines that have that are Ubuntu 1304 and have more than two gigs of RAM free because you want to go and migrate them, uh, a virtual machine to the host, uh, you can easily do that through format. And 
all the facts on the machine. So even custom facts that you write yourself will get populated in here. So same thing, right? You can say, give me all the hosts that have a factor version less than 1.4 and a puppet version less than uh, 0.25 and then go and upgrade them. Uh, and coming soon there will be some new stuff to be able to actually go and take action on hosts. So you can say, give me all the hosts that look like this and then you can go run app get update and app get upgrade or um, yum update. So when I want to go and create a new host, you can see um, Brian's <laughs> Brian's uh, Raspberry Pi hooked up to my Foreman instance, but when I want to go and provision a new host, I just click new host. We also have a, an API and a, a CLI to be able to manage all this stuff in other ways. So if you have an existing CMDB, you can provision new hosts through Foreman without having to completely rip that system out. So I'm going to provision on US West 1, which was having API issues earlier today, but hopefully it'll work. It's EC2, so I don't think it's going to work anyways. <laughs> so like, let's say this is my naming scheme for new hosts. I just want to go and create a new box. Um, you can see I put it into the base host group here, which means I get to kind of, uh, I use a base host group for everything, so host groups are nested, which means all the stuff that I want to configure. Like, I always want to have, um, SSH configured properly. I always want to have all my correct users on this host. I always want to have uh, NTP set up so that there isn't horrible time drift. Um, but if I wanted to create a pulp node, for example, or a builder, which just runs pbuilder and mock, um, or a new virtualization machine, I could put them into the host group. You can also take hosts that are in ex an existing host group and change what they're supposed to be. So say you had um, a machine that was in the base host group just because you wanted to kind of get started with it, and you provision it and it's all ready to go, and now you want to turn that into something like an Apache server, you can just put it into the web group, say that's the name of your, your host group, um, and then it'll get reprovisioned uh, next time Puppet runs. It actually doesn't completely reprovision, it just has the, the Puppet agent run on it and it applies the new configuration. So these are all the classes I want, um, basic stuff in the base host group. The only thing we do on most of the, the public compute resources is configure the domain the host should live in. So it's going to be uswest112.samcotler.com. There's some other ones. And I'm going to make this an Ubuntu 13.04 machine. And then you saw the Ubuntu finished script, which is right here. Um, this will get run on the host. So all of the So the script will get run on the host, so um, all these different actions will get executed. But the stuff that really matters is we'll basically get the machine into a state where I can debug it if, it if something goes wrong during provisioning, and also install the base dependencies for being able to then run Puppet on it. So when this host gets provisioned, an entry will get added to Foreman to be able to sign the host certificate. So instead of having to manually, as I said, go onto the box, and manage the machine um, and you know sign its key when it requests it, uh, Foreman will automatically do that when the host checks it. So run Puppet Agent twice just to make sure things are worked out. <laughs> Anyone who does a lot of Puppet stuff, like usually <coughs> between seven and 12 times and the host will be good. Um, and I'm just gonna make, actually I'll make this uh, and M1 small is fine. And then these are all the parameters on the host. So the log watch emails will go to me. If I'm, if I'm not me, um, I can override that parameter, for example. Um, and then I can go down here and say, my real email is this. And then the box will get provisioned and this will be used instead. And I own it. And you can disable um, reporting if you want. So this is an option if you're just using provisioning. If you're going to configure everything via finished script, you don't need to have reporting. And then we'll pray to the EC2 API gods that this will work. Um, and so what this is doing, and once this host actually gets an IP, uh, I'm going to look at it. 
But you can see here, this is my EC2 account. It provisioned the host. Um, the machine is coming online. It's an M1 small, just like we set up in the default security group. And so once the box is up, so the box came up really quickly. Um, but once the box is up, we basically uh, probe SSH until it's online. Once SSH is running, then we enable certificate signing. So there's only a very short window where this machine can get a certificate. And then once it checks in, it already has that cert. And then, so we're enabling the certificate. And now the instance is coming online. And once it, it's up, so I can actually show you the script running. So here's my filled out script, and here's the finished script running on the host. So apparently Amazon's network is really slow today, but if it were running faster, um, we would have packages installed a lot more quickly. But that script is just running. And you can see that script. Uh, still didn't matter. Um, <laughs> but you can see that script, the filled in values are here. So um, this is the administrator key, for example. That's my pub key. If you want to give me access to your servers, feel free. Um, <laughs> um, and so basically, this is just the filled out script. So you can see all the parameters that came from the host, like the host name, are now filled out here. And we just SSH to this box. You can also see. One of the other really annoying things about um, managing big, large-scale infrastructure on EC2 is having to pass around like a launcher key, and a lot of people do this, where they have like one key that, like, when a new person starts, you you email them the .pem, and then you use that to launch everything. And when someone leaves, it's still in the Ubuntu user's account. Um, that's pretty bad. So <laughs> um, instead of doing that, Foreman will create a unique key pair for each uh, instance that gets launched. So another cool feature, and maybe that host is done now, let's see. So this is Puppet running for the first time. This is what Puppet calls a plug-in sync, which is getting a bunch of functions onto the host so that we can then go and provision it. Um, and so this, this machine got provisioned, it came online, we SSH'd into it, ran this finish script that we configured on it, and now it's getting Puppet stuff installed. Um, one of the nice things about building machines that are d only trying to get into the kind of most minimal desired state on the first run is that you get to do really complex stuff with Puppet, which makes things a lot easier than having to figure out which parameters need to go into a kickstart and where things land. So Puppet is kind of um, the thing that should take the, the most minimal machine and then configure it. So you can see here, NTP got configured. NTP starting. We're disabling the Puppet uh, service because I'm just going to use a cron job. I installed some packages. You get the idea. So this, uh, this is kind of a dud uh, failure. It actually succeeded, but it returns a weird exit code. So, um, but you'll see that finish up. And then that host, once it's completely provisioned, will come online. <coughs> One of the cool things about machines that uh, have remote Spice and VNC consoles is we have this in-browser console that I'll actually show you. <coughs> this machine's across the ocean, too, so that's even cooler. Um, but it's not Java, it's not any weird Flash stuff, it's HTML5 in the browser and we're connected to a Spice console on it. Um, which is, if you've ever had to kind of connect to a VM through Vert Manager and deal with that, it's not a fun situation. So this is really cool. Um, I can like remove the installation logs. Yeah. And we generate a unique password each time we do this, so we talk to the compute resource get a new password, and then authenticate with it so that you can't hijack a session afterwards. 
And this machine's online now. So that provisioning script finished running, and you can see NTP's running, which is one of the things we install. So um, as you kind of build more and more complete hosts, um, the, the overall goal is to be able to, to reprovision these at any time. So, like for example, if I wanted to suddenly get rid of this host, I can just delete it. And now, it's getting terminated. You can also see um, all the different things that are available in a host group. So say I want to turn this into a Postgres machine, uh, or actually let's say I want to turn it into a hypervisor to run Libvirt on top of it. So this also inherits base, and then it has a name. Um, all the hosts that we provision in this host group are in the production environment. Uh, this is a case where we're using a real network um, and provisioning or getting a DHCP lease back. Um, if this was a fresh host, you would actually either be prompted to enter a MAC address or, um, sorry, you'd be prompted to enter a MAC address and we would potentially give you an IP address based on the next available one on the DHCP server that we talked to through the, um, through the smart proxy. You can say everything that lives in this host group is of this operating system. So if you have different infrastructure tiers that are managed differently, so if you have uh, different OS's across them, so for example, you may have all your web machines run Debian, but all your database servers run RHEL, um, you can manage it this way as well. And you also see, when you're creating uh, new hosts, you can choose to use the same partitioning table for all of them, so in this case, it just sets up TXT4. You can also set up parameters that are global to all the hosts that live here and then override them on individual hosts. So if you want to say, you know, this is one of our labs um, in Tel Aviv, and if you want to say talk to this Yum repo because it's way closer, you don't have to talk across the public internet, um, you can kind of configure any of these parameters and then consume them in Puppet to be able to set values based on that. Um, and same thing, if you have like local NTP peers, you could do that. Um, so, while I'm in the web interface, does anyone have questions, want to see anything? So, if your public, how well, so, if your, yeah, if your public classes have, uh, are parameterized already, uh, we use parameterized classes to set these values. So, the way that that works is we import the signature. So, like, if you have, um, if the add-ons test URL is set in the signature to be yum.sat.lab.tlb.redhat.com, um, we can actually go and read the signature out of the, the class while it's getting imported, and then that'll be the default unless you change it. Um, one puppet thing that makes, uh, that makes things a little challenging is a lot of uh, more modern puppet modules use parameterized classes, but they also use a class called param, which means we have to go and read stuff out of param, and we can't effectively pre-populate the values in there. So sometimes the value just points to another value. It can get a little weird. Yeah. How can you secure the system? Secure the system in what, in what way? Preventing anything that has an unauthorized user. Oh, in the Foreman web interface? Yeah, so the whole thing has, um, has I didn't show this so much because it's a little enterprisey, but the, the whole system has an RBAC model, so there are roles. Uh, we can hook into your external LDAP system if you have one. Um, so pretty robust access controls. And those same access controls are available in the API. Sam, I don't think most people heard the question. Can you just Sorry, so the it? question was, um, is there a security model or is this web interface just public to anyone who goes to it? And the answer is no, it's not public to anyone who goes to it. There's a security model, and we integrate with LDAP. Yeah? Um, for issues two, what kind of property for provisioning of issue two, what kind of properties can you set? Like, can you specify your code groups? Uh, for EC2, 
So for EC2, um, the way the standard EC2 pattern is you create a compute resource for each region because we don't support multiple regions in a single compute resource. And then on top of that, um, you would go, you can set things like security groups. Um, we have VPC support. So if you're provisioning inside of a VPC, um, you can provision in that VPC. One thing that we don't have right now is uh, is being able to manage external EBS volumes. So obviously, if the AMI manages uh, uses EBS for its root volume, we use an EBS volume. But we don't have a way to say, I want to provision this host, and it should have eight EBS volumes uh, available at these mount points. Um, so that's another thing that we could make more robust in the, on the EC2 provisioning side of things. Um, and just to repeat that question as well. If, <laughs> Make the same mistake two times in a row. Um, the question was, what kind of parameters do we support changing in EC2? Can I give you the mic here? Yeah. Uh, we use tags on EC2 to mm -hmm. silo out cost by service, uh, environment, whatnot. Do you have the ability to add tags to resources at this time? So you can. Uh, you can't add a direct tag. So we could fairly easily add tags to um, hosts just to be able to say like this exact thing right like this is this machine is this client's machine or this machine uh, is reserved for example like that would be a common tag but right now uh, we don't have tag it would be pretty pretty easy to add um, I think we should do it. any other things? Is so the question was, does it run on EC2 or does it run anywhere? It runs anywhere. So um, one of the, you can provision machines on Libvirt, Rackspace, um, OpenStack, VMware, GCE, there's pull request for, uh, and Foreman itself is just uh, a Rails app and a database. So it can, it can run anywhere. We have someone in the community who set it up on a Raspberry Pi. Put that in your data center. <laughs> So, um, Can we repeat the question? sorry, the question, yet again, the question is, uh, do you have to, if you're using Kickstarter pre seed do you have to already have the Kickstart files in Foreman, or sorry, outside of Foreman and then bring them in? No, so they're just another provisioning template. So here, let me go, um, so like here's a, I'm trying to find, so here's a good Kickstart. Yeah, I'll use that. So this is, you know, this looks like a standard kickstart. And so the way you configure it is um, you configure the, you configure it so that uh, you have an option in like Grub where when the host comes online, it sends its MAC address along with um, a request to a given URL. So if you're managing like static kickstarts, you right now like, have an Apache or Nginx server or some kind of server that serves out the, the kickstarts. In this case, Foreman actually generates them. Um, I can show you this if you want, but it's basically you point, we are your now, we're your kickstart server. Um, so you pointed us, and when that MAC address gets sent, you match the MAC with a, a MAC on a host that you told us was gonna exist, and then render the template. Okay, follow up to that though. Yeah. Um, so, Hold on a second, I'm going to bring the mic over it's here. So, in, so, in terms of like the, the machines coming up and you're trying to pixie boot so that you can do a Kickstarter or a pre seed to start with, like how, so you're saying that you're going to include the MAC address within the grub menu, but how are you having it automatically pixie boot and know where the CFTP server is, yep. the preload? All so, the way it works right now, and I should, this is something that I think is cool and I should show, um, is the, this, you have a smart proxy running on your TFTP server, and the smart proxy then gets assigned to a subnet that you manage in Foreman, 
And then when you say, I want to make this a, um, when you say, I want to make this, say, a CentOS 6.4 machine, we then go and fetch off of a, a local or remote uh, site the initRD and kernel and then install them correctly, write out a uh, Pixie configuration onto the disk, and then when the machine boots up, it gets that config. So that's how the form and URL and all that stuff gets provisioned. So I'll show you um, installation media, or what these are called. And so like, these are all the different mirrors that ship by default, and there are a few additional ones just that are red hat specific, but um, these are, you know, the Israeli Debian mirror, for example, is one that we added because this machine's in Israel. Um, and it'll go and then fetch the Tardup and disk and all that stuff. And then it writes it out to disk. So if you have, so these are like all the different subnets that you have. Um, so let's go look at like this one, for example. <coughs> going through VPN across the ocean. So it's a little bit slow. There's no reservation. But you can see all the reservations. And when you assign a new host on the subnet, we add the reservation to the DHCP. And then on, I'm assuming on the page where you're selecting the, the host and you select bare metal, top of the MAC address. Yeah, so, so that all of that's just automated. Right there, exactly. So when you create a new host, deploy it on bare metal, say it's like in the base host group. You give it the Mac. Whoa. You give it the Mac. And if there's an IP address that's if there's a subnet that's available to it and it's configured to talk to and the smart proxy is configured to talk to DHCP on that subnet, uh, we'll go and say give me the next available release and then assign it to this host and then all you have to do is enter the Mac. So another thing that uh, is a pretty common pattern that, that people do is, um, especially on like Libvirt, for example, is they uh, build their hosts in a DHCP environment, so they have a build network, um, and then they decided, which is probably a good decision, that DHCP is not that awesome for production. And so they build hosts in a DHCP environment, fill out the network data, like you know the gateway and all the stuff that you have to fill in in a Kickstarter or pre-seed, and then they when that machine gets installed, when it reboots after installation, it comes up into the production environment. So, so I think we had a question on the left here. Yeah. Hi. I've been training for a month, and what we've been doing is, what we want to do is to have all our bare metal servers to be production, but we seen that it, it, we we, see, we saw that we have to go and fetch every server MAC address and set it up here. So I'm going to talk in the roadmap portion about how we're fixing that. So the issue is that right now you still have to have a server monkey go out to the machines, get the MACs off the NICs, and then you know do the installation, um, which is really really error prone because typing MAC addresses for a while is incredibly annoying. And at a point, you get driven crazy and don't want to do it anymore. Um, and so we, uh, we're working on an auto discovery system that will basically let you use TFTP in a DHCP environment uh, to be able to go and grab this. And I'll talk about this much more in the kind of final section of the presentation. But you'll grab this image that will have just a tiny kernel on it uh, and factor. And the, it'll boot up. It'll talk back to your uh, foreman host and say these are the machines that are available for provisioning, they live on this machine, and I've detected that we have IPMI on this box. And then when it's time to boot that up, change the BIOS settings so that it network boots again, the network boot happens, grabs the correct production um, kernel and RAM disk, and then provision it. Um, so, but yeah, that is really, really annoying, and it's a problem that a lot of people are trying to solve with varying levels of success. So another tool in the same space is um, is Razor, which is Puppet Labs' project, and I believe it also has Chef support now. Um, but Razor is more model driven than we are, so we don't yet have the thing where you say, like, 
all of the machines that have 8 gigs of RAM and um, a 3.0 gigahertz CPU are app servers, but ultimately we may have that. Right now it's very free for But this is completely available already. We've written the entire thing. Um, it's available as a plugin, so we don't, it's not in form and core, but you can add the plugin to your system. Um, and a guy on our team named Greg has been working on it for a while. It's actually a very, very, very intricate problem that you have to solve lots of edge cases for. So, yeah. Is Forman going to have chat support? Yes. So, actually, how about this? I'll deliver my roadmap portion and then we. Uh, <laughs> So auto discovery is what this thing is called. <laughs> Literally the next slide. <laughs> um, auto discovery is what this thing's called. So um, again, it's an initial thing that runs in memory and you provision hosts off of it. They're all available in Foreman. So you basically say like, these are my inventory of hosts and then when it's time to actually go and build out a new host, you get to go into Foreman and say like, ooh, I like this, you know, Dell R720 and then you go and provision hosts. Quota management is along the same lines which with the model driven stuff where you say like the first five servers that look like this need to become app servers and then the second ten servers that look like this need to become database servers. Um, this is another thing where we can implement it at the host group level so you can say in this host group I want hosts that look like this and then we can go and match them and you can put limits on it. So a lot of companies that need to do stuff like um, they have a lot of old hosts and they need to provision new ones and they want to be able to auto discover all the new ones because they're living in new racks and new data centers and stuff. Um, they want to be able to auto provision new data centers and essentially the way they do this is they want to be able to say I want to destroy this machine but I don't have enough capacity to destroy a lot of them at once. So delete one, create a new one, delete one, create a new one and then auto provision stuff into host groups. Does that, I know that was long winded, does that answer the question? That's it. How about the installation of the custom apps? How easy it is to install custom apps? Of custom apps for home development and house development apps. Oh, so Puppet um, is completely generic, so you would just use Puppet to do it. Um, Puppet isn't a great deployment tool. Um, neither, you shouldn't use config management for deployment, but um, if you're going to do that, use Puppet. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely there's there's a lot of um, there are a lot of people who do deploy with it, but yeah, you can write any puppet module you want, and you just add it to your puppet master and then do the format. Brian has a question. Run deck integration. Oh uh, yeah, so we have M collective integration. We also have Run deck integration, um, and this will be coming. The M collective, the plan is for M collective to become a lot more robust. So you can, for those of you who are unfamiliar with M collective. Um, it uses a plug-in based model to manage remote machines through AMQB. Um, and basically the way it works is you have plugins that exist on systems or on the M Collective master, and then you go out and manage machines that are kind of connected to the system. They're subscribing to an AMQB channel. And uh, Rundeck and, and uh, M Collective are kind of, of of the same mind in that you should be able to manage those through Foreman. So right now we have Rundeck integration, which is Rundeck is a Java-based tool that lets you do remote host management, um, and you can you can do stuff like uh, just run simple remote commands on hosts that are managed through Foreman. So that's a cool thing. But yeah, Rundeck would also let you do stuff like um, set up new boxes that would be integrated through like your custom deployment process. Um, Although, also kind of a weird, a weird thing to get. Do you have anything for salt or unsimple? Um, let me get to that section. So, another thing that we're working on, and we have a very, very rapidly growing community, is having a, a plugin ecosystem. So, uh, about six months ago, we started. Imp we implemented a, a kind of more robust uh, way for Rails engines to be able to hook into Foreman, and. Rails engines are basically just little apps um, that you load into the into your Rails app as it's running. And so Discovery is the biggest one that we've implemented, but we're also implementing things like repository <coughs> management as plugins. So if you need those kinds of things, if you need um, you know Debian and RPM based um, repo management, you know, Yum repos, you, you can do that stuff through this plugin that's getting developed. And all that development happens on GitHub. It's all GPLv3 as well. Um, 
and we're also working on, on packaging plugins. So right now we have Yum and Debian repos, and we want to be able to include plugins in there. So if you need the, the content plugin, you can just install that plugin. One of the other cool things is the content plugin that we're working on right now is uh, also able to manage puppet modules. So you can fetch modules off of the forge and add them to your library of content and then sync them out to a master. So that's, that, that'll be pretty robust in terms of its, uh, its capabilities. And we use Pulp, which is another uh, one of the open source Red Hat projects, to be able to manage the, the library and all the things that get synced out on the system. Pulp is like eight other talks, so uh, you can Google it. Uh, so that's the, this is the first major plugin, that's the URL. So uh, a really significant goal that we have is to be completely separate from every config management system. Uh, it's hard because all of them have drastically different semantics and work drastically differently, although they have a lot more similarities than I think a lot of people realize. Um, but we want to be able to, to use, Salt is actually an awesome example because Salt also supports ENCs. So adding Salt support would be easy. Um, but the first thing we have to do is kind of move Puppet out of form and core, and we're working on that right now. So um, move all the parsing and stuff out of form and core and into a plugin, and then you say, I'm going to use Chef, or I'm going to use Ansible, or I'm going to use Salt. And I think the coolest thing would be if you could manage hosts that are running with managed by Ansible or Chef or Puppet in one installation. So you provision them all the same way, but then this one group uses Salt and this other one uses Puppet or you know whatever whichever tools you choose, and you manage all of that through a single form and instance. I'm totally like damning myself now because now I have to go and work on it. But <laughs> um, I think so. I think if we have that kind of support will be in really good shape. Are there any other questions before? Yeah. I was just wondering, this is getting difficult. I was just wondering, I didn't quite follow, how could I use Foreman to provision uh, servers on non-EC2 or any, like, you know, AWS or whatever? On had... So on physical hardware? No, on cloud hardware. Uh, which cloud provider? Well, specifically, I'm thinking about LinNote, but like anyone that has like an API but doesn't have a supported API, for example. So, we use Fog, and Fog has supports like 60 cloud providers, um, and so we can add stuff to Foreman to be able to support everything on Linode. But if you just want to use unmanaged stuff, so right now we don't really support Linode, but if you have hosts running on there, you just get them to a point where you can install Puppet on them, you install, which is basically you know getting an OS on it, which you do through their web console or their API. And you from there just install Puppet and point at the, a Puppet Master that's configured to talk to Foreman, and then the whole thing will just work. You'll get reports from the Linode machine, uh, you can assign it to host groups, all that stuff. You just won't be able to destroy it when it's time to remove it or create new ones that look like it. But you still get to do a lot of really cool stuff. And we have a lot of users that only use Foreman for ENC and reporting. So they don't want to manage their entire system or you know, their politics involved. Like some guy wrote the system a while ago uh, and they don't want to deal with fighting with that person because it's like, it's their domain that they've managed for 78 years and whatever. Um, so we have a lot of people who just use PNC and, and reporting. And you still get a lot of stuff out of it. So, any other one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, earlier was mentioned uh, uh, MAC address entry. Um, most of the new hardware, I think, has barcodes for the MAC addresses. So you can either use a, a barcode gun, mm -hmm. put that directly in as a keyboard, scan it into your, uh, your Nexus with barcode reader app, whatever. Yep. Uh, but my actual question is about the, uh, the baseboard management controllers you mentioned earlier. So those are dramatically different between um, yeah. uh, you know, Dell and, and HP, just as two examples. Um, ITME isn't really different, but could you address how you how you I don't I'm not aware that there are any APIs on the BMCs on the Dell or uh, uh, HP ILOs. So can you address how that's handled? So uh, we talk to BMC and IPMI through uh, the Foreman proxy, and there's a gem that if you're going to do IPMI management, does all the talking to IPMI tool. 
So we actually talk to IPMyTool, which then does the, the stuff where it abstracts away Dell or APP. Yeah. Um, Hold on, wait for the mic. Start? Are you going to start using um, PuppetDB for getting reports, or have, like right now I think you, you install like a special piece of Ruby for Foreman to ship reports to it from your Puppet Master? Um, so, right now, there are a lot of people who are using, um, the kind of standard pattern I would say is uh, use PuppetDB for the stuff that you need to export. So exported resources you use PuppetDB for because it's way faster than the old version where like if you had more than 10 hosts it would take like hours to run Puppet on machines where you were collecting a lot of resources. Um, but the kind of standard configuration is you still send reports into Foreman but you just use PuppetDB as the back end for, um, for doing uh, exported resource stuff. Store configs. Um, and that seems to have worked really well so far because you don't really get very many reporting benefits from PuppetDB. Um, so Foreman can still be the canonical place to get reports, and then you just manage the the store config stuff, which is what PuppetDB is really great at um, in PuppetDB. There's a question on the right. So you talked about the um, the auto discovery for yeah. filling in MAC addresses, but let's just say that it's not going to be out for some time. It's already yeah, it is already yeah, okay. But so say that you've gone through, you have a data center that's supposed to come online. You already have a list of 100, 150 servers that you yeah. want to provision, but you don't want to do clicking through the UI. Yeah. Is there a way to script through and yeah, we have talk? an API. Um, so everything that's in the the UI is available in the API too. So if it's not, it's a bug. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, we have, we have a really robust API. People are the CLI actually consumes the API, so it's not. There's no shared Ruby library, it's just consuming the API. Question in the middle here. Maybe this is slightly off the topic, but uh, do you plan to stretch this to like managing applications also over a period of time, or would it just be limited to Server management. Um, managing applications in in what sense of like? Like for example, uh, right now you uh, integrate with Puppet yeah. and Chef, and you know, in future you plan to do other ones. Mm -hmm. There are tools like uh, like Blob the Deployer, yeah. Capistrano. Yeah, yeah. And so, so the way that people deal with that is by consuming the API. Right. So like. Uh, I actually can put it on GitHub tonight, but I like wrote a bunch of Capistrano scripts that query for a host group. So you say like host group, or sorry, uh, it uses cap ext, which is like lets you do multi-stage cap deployments, and it basically dynamically fills in all the available host groups. So you say like cap whatever deploy, and it then grabs all the IPs and sets them up in the host listing. Um, there's some missing stuff, like you can't do app and database separation right now, but it's just for doing like deploys where I want to query and get all the hosts back. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I've, also, I've also seen a, a fabric code where they make a form and query to fill in the hosts for a, a deployment environment, mm -hmm. and uh, I think I've seen that for Capistrano as well. Yeah. So basically you can just do any query that Foreman supports and say, push to these hosts. Yeah. So you can keep using the same tools. Um, there's also like a set of Python scripts that someone wrote that just spits back a list of hosts and you can just use a shell to get that inside of Capistrano. That's kind of like the the poor man slash I need to deploy in five minutes man way of doing the Capistrano. We have another question on the right here. Yeah. Uh, if I understand correctly, this is intended as an enterprise deployment, um, basically. So sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, is there a plugin, or could you build a plugin that would allow you to charge end users if you were a, like a host? Yes. So um, we have someone who I don't know what the status of it is recently, but we have someone who's writing a plugin to do billing based on host, which adds another thing to the host page, which says who the customer is. And then 
Um, I don't know if they did this, but they should, and I'll suggest it to them if they haven't. But Bill, like, if you're an Amazon reseller, for example, you probably want to know this, the price at which you bought that instance, if it was a spot instance, or whatever's going on. And so being able to expose that stuff as well would be cool. But yeah, there are people who are thinking about it for a long time. To follow up, um, what kind of, I, I didn't really see the metrics page very in great detail, so the, do, you, do you measure stuff like I.O., um, network I.O., uh, and? No, so uh, the, basically anything you can get out of the factor, you can fill in here. So you could write a factor fact, um, and for those of you who don't know what factor is, it's basically just any inventory off the system. You can write your own in Ruby, or I think you can even just do it in a shell script. And um, so you could track network I.O. yourself. So if you wanted to, if you had some system that locally knew how much I.O. the system was using, you could say like, since this NIC came up, I want to track the I.O. and then you could do the difference between the last time you ran factor and now perpetually in the need. It's a really sketchy solution, but it would work. Um, and so that's an option as well. Uh, but right now, we don't have, an, and I don't think we ever will hopefully, um, have an agent that runs that's like the foreman agent. We use Puppet to do our bidding on servers. Um, let's do one more question and then maybe get to the, uh, to the giveaways. If, if, uh, well, how much more there's, there's, there's two more slides. Okay, so. yeah, so let's, let's get through those. Sure. Yeah, um, so with Foreman, I see that you could you could see like, um, uh, I guess, charts of like changes and things that happen with Puppet. Can you just, can you view it only for that particular run or can you do it over a week's worth? Yeah, you can do it for, so you could say give me all of the reports over the last week. Um, or you can say I want to look at one run or I want to look at all the active runs. So I want to look at all the runs that change. You basically just get a search box and their parameters that will start auto-completing when you type that will let you say like give me all the reports back for this host where a change happened or yeah or you know okay. some, or there was a failed restart or stuff like that. Alright so um, we're nearing the end. Um, so Foreman has a pretty massive community. We now are in the three figures of contributors. Um, so really active development, friendly IRC channels, like shockingly friendly IRC channels, um, not IRC-like IRC channels. And um, we have two mailing lists, so we have a dev list and a users list. Both get responses within minutes, generally. Um, and our team is distributed all over the world. So uh, I'm the only one in North America, and then we have some Europeans, some people in Israel. So we basically have 24-7 support coverage, and it's pretty cool. Um, we have a website, and we're on GitHub. Uh, as I said before, it's a GPL v3 project, um, or v3 plus, I don't want Brian to yell at me. Um, <laughs> and um, all the development and stuff happens on GitHub. So uh, if you have anything you want to add, pull requests are the way. Um, and yeah. Um, we also, oh, oh, no, boy, um, <laughs> we, we also have some, um, some fairly prominent users. Um, so CERN is is probably our most prominent user, um, and they do real science with stuff that we make, which is cool. Um, <laughs> like computer science is like science, kind of. Um, uh, SpaceX as well, Mozilla, DHL, Symantec, you can read. And Betaworks, which I figured I would throw in since they're like a block that way, um, is another one, and they, they use it for digging it. That's it. Uh, feel free to email me. That's where I live on Twitter, so I'll probably be there as well. Um, so, okay. Sorry for interrupting. I was just gonna. So I'm gonna say we actually, like I said, we have a giveaway that's gonna um, be a after the uh, sort of giveaway that, that Sam's gonna run a minute. But I wanted to say, everyone, if you're interested, um, Julian and Opsworks are gonna be giving away uh, training on Chef. Right? That's correct. Yep. And so, if you all, if anyone wants, uh, is interested in, in uh, possibly receiving that for free. Uh, just put your name or a card or something in here, and Julian's going to come up and, and pick your name out of the bag uh, after Sam is done. So I'm just going to start passing this around up here for anyone who's interested. Can I have any interest here? Good. If not, just please pass the bag along so everyone gets a chance to uh, put, put in your card. Like, uh, pass, we'll pass the bag around.
<laughs> other people's cards. Yeah, <laughs> <right. laughs> <laughs> yeah, guys just oh, everyone just pass it around for a few minutes, and, and uh, we'll we'll get this or the giveaway organized. We have more than the normal number of books today. We've got. Um, we have to give away a good two book right now. <laughs> you, you have a uh, yeah a lot of. Um, so uh, everyone, just take a second, and we'll. Uh, let the bag make its way around a little bit. Once we see it's a little bit away, everyone will then be able to focus their attention on uh, going to the books. Now, the, the rule with the books is that make, Sam's going to ask a question, and then if you're interested in answering the question, you've got to get your hand up. Um, we do the best we can to be fair, uh, but wherever I am is probably the first hand I see and is what I'm going to go for. So I'll try to move around a little bit. If you call out, then I'm not. You don't get it if you call out first. It, it, it just makes things really, um, really kind of bad. Um, so just another minute, and we'll let the cards go around. You'll find out. You're going to find out. You'll find out. So what we we'll have, we have uh, three vouchers for eBooks from O'Reilly and Associates, where you get uh, the voucher and you get the free eBook. And we also have four physical books. When you answer the question, you come up and you take your pick. All right. Everyone, uh, everyone have? Okay. Big giveaway then. This, this is kind of a new thing. We're trying to figure this out. So, uh, are you ready? Sure. Okay, first question. Uh, what configuration management system is form and support right now? Uh, gentleman over here in the uh, black. Just call it out. Uh, I, I heard puppet. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to give you more work. All right. We have a PHP book, a Ganglia book, a Nagios book, and an Ubuntu book. Four vouchers. Yeah. All right. One one down. Uh, six to go. <laughs> I'm making these up. Um, all right, what's the system called that we're building uh, to manage physical hosts by net looting them? Uh, I saw you first. Sure. All right. <laughs> we have six of these. I, I fix it. Was the, was the accepted answer. Or those. One of those, yeah. All right, All right five. Still plenty left. Oof. Uh, <laughs> um, what is the, uh, how do you group hosts together into roles? What's that system called? Host groups. I, I, hey, 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 hey. I saw your hand up first. Host group? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Host group was the, uh, the answer. All right, we'll do this out with you so we can see we've got a far distance to walk. Um, what is it called, uh, or what are the, what's the system called that we use to dynamically generate kickstarts and pre -seeds? Brian. <laughs> well, Brian's disqualified. Hold on. <laughs> Was anyone paying attention? <laughs> what's the, okay, uh, this is easier. Um, what's the name of the script that we run on hosts after they're provisioned over SSH? I'm sorry, you first? It's final scripts? Yeah. Oh, final, you said? Finish. 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 <laughs> yes. Four left. I didn't find out until yesterday. Um, next question. Alrighty. Um, what name one of the uh, compute providers that Foreman supports? Uh, so your hand over there. PC two. Sure. <laughs> vouchers are gone, so we have PHP and MySQL web development, and Nagios as well. All right. Um, if you don't want either of these, then don't raise your Or I'll send you a rel book. Um, or that. Um, and he gets to take home the books. 
<laughs> um, what do we call, uh, or I guess, what's the 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 tool that we use to get configuration from Foreman and tell Puppet what kind of machine and node should be? ENCs. Yep. ENCs. <laughs> what what is the remote thing that runs on nodes to be able to apply public configuration? Back in the corner. Factor. No, no. Oh, oh, right. Right. Yeah, right. puppet agent. <laughs> Did you want the book or not? Huh? He just he just yelled it. <laughs> uh, uh, it's fine. Uh, Okay, so so the the main the main event there, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, I think Julie, do you want to come up and do the uh, now? Thank you. Uh, then, uh, the, the, the icing on the cake here. So, uh, Julian, do you want to give a quick, uh, like, a, a better description of what this is for? Yeah, definitely. So, I'm Julian Dunn. I'm with Ops Code. We make Chef. Uh, so, even though Sam mentioned Puppet about 50 times during his presentation, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that he's uh, adding Chef support and other other configuration making support to form. So, that was a really awesome talk. So, um, Ops Code is doing a Chef Fundamentals training course later this month, August 22nd and 23rd. Um, and I will post some details on the Meetup page because there's a discount code for anybody that doesn't win tonight but wants to get a discount uh, through the Meetup group to attend that. It's uh, Basics of Chef, uh, getting you up and running very quickly. So that's what this draw is about. Uh, free seat at training. Actually, we should have Sam draw. Oh, yeah, let's yeah. do that. Hold on. <laughs> Something else you have nothing to do with. It's so easy. It's right. so much easier than coming up with questions. <laughs> All right, who is it? Robert Quills? Robert Quills. There you go. Congratulations. There you are. Is that something that'll interest you? We'll find out. Well, <laughs> I just want to make sure if you're going to go, you think. All right, if not, let us know. Let Julie and then we'll figure out how to spread the love, okay? <laughs> Give it to me. Yeah. All right, well, thanks, everyone. So we're going to get going, get going to the, uh, the after meetup bar. That's uh, over on 8th Avenue and 14th Street, 250 West of 14th Street.